My teaching partner at Bethel University always starts off his portion of the class by asking students to answer a question on a small response sheet that he provides. It's his way of taking attendance. Sometimes the questions are serious. Like on Tuesday, he asks, what's one thing you did to make the world a better place over Thanksgiving break? Other times, they're silly. For example, Thursday, he asks our students, if you could ban one Christmas song, what would it be? The first students to share vowed they loved all Christmas songs and wouldn't get rid of any Christmas music. Another student, after saying everyone was probably going to hate him, admitted he doesn't like Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. And there was a general outcry after this admission. A few perennial fav favorites of previous generations, like Baby It's Cold Outside, are now considered creepy by many young people. So even though Bruce Springsteen's version is one of my favorite songs, I have to admit Santa Claus is Coming to Town does have some creepy lines, like he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. I do, however, remember using this song to get my kids to behave in December. I wonder if any kids today look for hidden cameras in their room after hearing these, these lines. If you have kids here, cover their ears, are listening. But I can say that I don't think Santa knows when you're asleep or awake, and I don't think he knows if you've been good or bad. Santa is a cultural construct. Apparently, the Dutch version of St. Nicholas was called Sinterklaas in the early days of America, and he became known as Santa Claus. However, unlike Santa Claus, God does see us when we're sleeping. He sees us when we're awake. He knows if we've been bad or good, and he knows how much we need saving. Our Advent series this year is called Incarnation, and we're looking at various names Jesus is called in Scripture. The word incarnate means to embody, be embodied in flesh in human form. Jesus is the human incarnation of God, God in human form. He is the long-awaited Messiah, the King promised in the time of David. Jesus is also a Savior. Our scripture reading this morning from Matthew's Gospel focuses on Joseph wrestling with what to do after discovering his fiancée, Mary, is pregnant. He knows he is not the biological father of the baby. Joseph is a good man who does not want Mary to be hurt or shamed as women who committed adultery were under the law of Moses. He planned to be discreet in breaking their marriage contract. But then he had a dream where an angel appeared to him saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Jesus is the Greek version of the name used throughout the New Testament. But in Hebrew, the name is Yehoshua. This name combines the name Yahweh, the personal name of God, and the Hebrew word Yasha, which means to save or to deliver. This name tells us the purpose of the incarnation of God. God saves or God delivers. Jesus is God's instrument of salvation. The angel tells Joseph, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus has barely been conceived by the Holy Spirit and the angel tells Joseph of God's plans for this baby to save him, his people from their sins. In the same way, shortly after Jesus is born, an angel tells the shepherds outside Bethlehem, Don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. Your Savior is born today. And the Savior is born not just for the shepherds, but for the wonderful, joyous news is he has been born for all people. Because God knows how much all people need salvation. God knows how much all people need to be saved. Have you ever been asked the question, are you saved? Other Christian denominations and traditions seem to focus on this a bit more than we in the Methodist tradition do. Often people in these traditions can point to a specific day, time, and place where they experienced Christ's deliverance and put their trust in him. And perhaps some of you listening can do the same. However, many people I've met in the United Methodist Churches admit that they can't name a specific moment. And I personally struggle when asked to name the specific place or time that I was saved. 
Some of us may feel sort of less than as Christians when we can't give a specific detail, but that doesn't mean we're not saved. Some of us may struggle with the word saved and especially how to describe what it means to people who are not Christians. Adam Hamilton, a pastor who wrote the book Incarnation, on which our Advent series is based, admits he tends not to use the word saved too much, even though it's a word used multiple times in the New Testament. Now, his church's mission is specifically focused on um, bringing people that are less committed to become more committed, and he always has uh, the unchurched in the back of his mind. So he thinks that um, saved sometimes feels like a church insider word. And even the people inside the church seem to be a little bit unclear about what exactly it means. In considering the meaning of the name Yehoshua, we learned that save is not the only way the word can be translated. Deliver or rescue or help are all ways to translate the words, and that might give us another idea about how Jesus works. Also, when looking at the ways the word is used in the New Testament, we find that it's used in a variety of ways. It's used to describe physical healing, forgiveness, rescuing from one's enemy, rescuing from disaster, deliverance from suffering, an internal transformation, and God's deliverance at the last day. Being saved is perhaps all of the above and more. Adding to this mix is that the word is used in various tenses in the New Testament. Past, like Jesus has already saved. Present progressive, Jesus is in the process of saving us, but not yet done, one of my favorites, and future, Jesus will save us. Being saved is not a simple concept because there are so many ways that Jesus saves us. But a couple of key points stand out to me. First, as the angel told Joseph, Jesus will save his people from their sin. Jesus' death on the cross was a sacrifice once and for all, for all of our sin. Doesn't mean we'll never sin again, though I wish it did, But it means that when we confess, repent, and accept Jesus' forgiveness, we no longer are slaves to sin. That means we do not need to continue to carry the burden of our past sins, the guilt and the shame. One way I like to picture this dates back to when when my husband and I hiked to the bottom of the Grand Canyon around Christmas time in 1993 with our families. On the hike down, there was another family in front of us, mom, dad, and two little girls about seven to nine years old. The mom had a decent-sized backpack on her. The girls had what I call show backpacks. You know, they showed a picture of Dora, but they really um, couldn't carry much. But the dad, wow, the dad had one of the biggest, heaviest-looking loads I have ever seen a human being carry on his back. It looked like he had tents, sleeping bags, and food for the entire family for a week. The pack towered over him as he trudged along, head down. Here's what I remember the most. It's a long, hard trip down the Bright Angel Trail to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But the little girls were gleefully running down the trail and then turning around and running back up to their dad, who was bent over trudging along. And let's just say he was not enjoying the journey as his daughters were, and he wasn't shy about letting them know that. When I imagine carrying a load of sin, I think back to that man with the huge backpack. He did not seem to be enjoying the hike down the Grand Canyon. And it's considered one of the most beautiful hiking trails in the entire world. He was more focused on the heavy load he was carrying than the world around him. Being forgiven of our sin does not mean that we will be, our life will be easy or painless. Hiking the Grand Canyon is challenging even if you're not carrying a heavy backpack. But without the heavy pack, it's not just lighter, it's easier to see the beauty around you too. I know this because I was pregnant at the time we hiked the Grand Canyon, so my husband and my dad were carrying all of my gear in their backpacks, and I was carrying a show backpack. They willingly carried my gear because they loved me and wanted to lighten my load. Jesus willingly carried our sin on the cross because he loves us. If everyone accepted his offer to carry our sin, the world might be easier for everyone. We will still have inner struggles with temptation. We will still miss the mark sometimes, but we're no longer slaves to sin and condemned to carry heavy loads of guilt and shame because Jesus saves us from our sin. Flowing from this idea that we are no longer condemned to be slaves to sin, Jesus saves us from hopelessness, meaningless, and despair. 
How many times have you said or heard someone said, say, I don't know how people get through something like this without faith. During his life, Jesus ministered to all kinds of people, blind and lame people begging in public. I imagine they felt pretty hopeless. The man, full of so many demons, he was called Legion, for they are many. Imagine his, I imagine his life was also full of despair, living in isolated in a cemetery. The woman who had had five husbands and the man she was currently with wasn't actually her husband. Perhaps her life felt meaningless as she went from one failed relationship to the next, searching for someone, anyone, who would truly care for her. Jesus saw each of these people, and as he ministered to them, he said, you matter to God. You matter to me. Your life has value and meaning and purpose. You are loved. This is Jesus's message to all people. I'm sure there have been times in each of our lives when we've needed to hear these words from Jesus. Sometimes Jesus speaks them through a pastor on Sunday morning. Sometimes you encounter them in scripture. Sometimes from a friend, family member, or even on social media. Sometimes from a song. A friend posted a story this week about a man who's now a pastor who writes this about the time he was driving home from college for Christmas break. He writes, Having rejected and having been rejected from my church, I wasn't practicing any faith during my college years, which were marked by intense social and political activism over the very issues that had separated me from my church's faithlessness on justice and peace, a church my parents had helped to start and that was our family's second home. He goes on to say that as he drove home from college every Christmas, he would listen to Christmas carols on the radio and weep because they reminded him of what God's world is all about and therefore what our lives should be too. The Christmas carols reminded him of that our only hope is that light does come in the darkness and that this child born in an animal stall is still more important than all the kings and rulers that we are forced to watch and listen to all the time. Christmas songs can remind us that we have real hope in a sometimes dark world. Christina Rossetti wrote a poem in 1885 that has become the Christmas carol, Love Came Down at Christmas. The song reminds us that love was born at Christmas, star and angels gave the sign, love incarnate, love divine. The love that came down at Christmas was a love like no other. When we reach out toward that love, we can find hope and meaning and life. Even when we feel unloved or when someone tells us no one loves us or that we're unlovable, they do not speak for God. God loves us all. At the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, God creates a perfect world, a world in which humans are intimately connected with God, intimately connected with one another, intimately connected to creation, and intimately connected to themselves. They knew who God created them to be. When Adam and Eve listened to the serpent's lies rather than God's teaching in the garden, and they ate the apple from the tree of life, sin entered this beautiful, perfect world that God had created. All these intimate, perfect relationships were damaged. Jesus, the incarnation of God's love, came to earth to repair these damaged relationships, to restore us to a right relationship with God, to remind us of how to treat one another as God intends us to, to heal our inner selves, our guilt, our shame, our proneness to wander, and to reconnect us to creation in a way that fills our souls. Uh, when my dad saw the Grand Canyon for the first time, all that he said was, how can anyone look at this and not believe in God? That's the type of feeling creation was designed to, to bring about in us. One of my spiritual mentors shared an image on Facebook this week that brought home this idea to me and I'm sure many others in a really powerful way. It was painted by Sister Great Remington of Monastery Candy and it shows two women in the Bible. Now these two women are not often pictured together because their stories in scripture are nowhere near each other. Eve and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Lauren Eberspacher, who shared this image on her Facebook page, from Blacktop to Dirt Road, asks us to look at the despair on Eve's face in her sin and shame. Eve still holds the forbidden fruit and the serpent still coils around her leg. 
Many of us can probably relate to Eve's feelings. But Eve's hand is stretched out to Mary, as if she knows hope can be found there. Eberspacher notes Mary's face is full of compassion as she reaches out to touch Eve. Under Mary's foot, the head of the serpent is being crushed, just as Genesis 3 prophesied. The baby Mary is carrying will destroy Satan's power over us because this baby is God incarnate. As the angel told the shepherds, your Savior is born today in David's city. The Savior of all people is born in Bethlehem. At the beginning of this chapter, Hamilton shares a story that he says has been shared by innumerable pastors over the years, so I am going to join that line and share it today. Hamilton says, Excited about Christmas, a little boy was finishing a letter to Santa with a list of all the Christmas presents he badly wanted. And then, just to make sure he had covered all his bases, he decided to send his Christmas list to Jesus as well. The letter to Jesus began, Dear Jesus, I just want you to know that I have been good for six months now. Then it occurred to him that Jesus knew this wasn't true. After a moment's reflection, he crossed out six months and wrote three months. He thought some more and then crossed out months and replaced that with weeks. I've been good for three weeks, his letter now read. Realizing Jesus knew better than this, He put down his paper, went over to the nativity sitting on the table in his home, and picked up the figure of Mary. He then took out a clean piece of paper and began to write another letter. Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again. The good news is that even though probably none of us could honestly say we've been perfectly good for six months or three months or three weeks, just like the little boy, we do not have to threaten Jesus to get his forgiveness. All we have to do is confess our sin to Jesus, whether we've committed them two hours, six months, or 20 years ago. We can repent and accept the gift of forgiveness Jesus offers, not just at Christmas, but any time of the year. What a powerful gift that is, a gift that takes away our heavy burdens and guilt and lets us lift our heads to walk in the light of God's love. The baby in the manger was born to save all people from their sin. That includes you, And that includes me. Amen.